Wonderful. Thank you, Skylar. And welcome back, everyone, to episode five of our webinar series. If you've been with us from the beginning, welcome back. We're glad to have you. Hope you still find it valuable. If you're just joining us, uh, well, I hope you like what you see today. Got some great guests lined up, and, and I hope you see that there is a continuity that we've tried to build in to the curriculum. Um, today's episode uh, involving direct specialty care, something that is is really timely, and I have to admit, uh, surprised me. About a month ago, we were down at the um, the FMMA annual conference, and the 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 depth of appetite among clinicians that were specialists to to, to explore direct specialty care blew me away. Uh, maybe that's because it, it, from our perspective at Freedom Health Works, it's been primarily uh, a primary care phenomenon, but no more. Uh, there are uh, great things happening on the specialty side, and today we're going to hear from two wonderful guests uh, that have firsthand experience in the space. So welcome back to episode five of the uh, Freedom Doc series in partnership with Lean Frontiers. Uh, glad to have you with us. As we always do, uh, I'm going to present a few slides to kind of crib the conversation, and uh, then we will take it from there. We'll save some room for Q&A at the end and um, hopefully get you out of here on time. That's kind of our, our goal, right? So um, let's see here. I uh, am going to share screen and away we go. Welcome back. A brief refresher on what this is, uh, hopefully a, a series of lunchtime webinar series. I get you out of here on time. We'll try our best to do that. But we want to save some room to, to hit some of the FAQs that arrived. And we appreciate you sending that. Please do continue to ask questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, even some of those that pop up during um, the presentation. Uh, and, and, and tune in. Uh, these are all, as Skylar said, available on demand uh, very quickly after we wrap today. So uh, by all means, tune in if you haven't seen some of the earlier episodes because they do build to this. Uh, this is the, the chapter in verse, and I hope everyone can see this. Um, the uh, the six-part series really starts very broadly in terms of what is direct-to-consumer medicine. You know, many people don't realize it's, it, it's, it's a grassroots, grassroots movement that is really taking shape, and it's happening everywhere across the country. So it's exciting things are happening. But we talked about what it is, how it compares in different variants. So episode two was concierge versus direct care. Episode three was thriving in independent practice, which is very important. Uh, and then last episode, building a local direct care micro network. So we're going to just briefly review each of those, the high points, and we'll also have some, some key takeaways for today's session before we get into the, uh, the meat of the webinar. But episode one recap, there are a few components that are absolutely critical to any direct-to-consumer or whether it's direct primary care, direct specialty care, these things don't change pricing clarity, the convenience of on-demand services, and allowing um, clinicians to fully focus their expertise on critical issues. Those things are consistent across the board. You're going to hear about that today. Uh, those never change. The key takeaways, uh, I, I love, this is my favorite, right? Borrowing successful efficiencies and innovations from other industries, bringing them into the medical space. Uh, there are a lot of companies doing things very well on the consumer side, and, and one thing we did talk about is please acknowledge we are in a consumer service business in medicine. So uh, let's borrow what works in other industries and import it to healthcare. To lower costs, you must first know the price. Goes without saying. Um, eliminating barriers to access is what drives consumer satisfaction. So you, you liken that to other industries, eliminating the barriers that get in the way, selling direct, providing services direct, Think of your, your, your Netflix and your, your Uber versus the cable company, taxis, you name it, right? These are better ways that consumers really enjoy consumer services. And then insurance is a great financial instrument, but it's the wrong currency for most medical care. So if you were here for episode one, hopefully you had those takeaways. Episode two, I'm going to, to briefly hit um, concierge care versus direct. There is some confusion. The big takeaway here, they both have similarities in terms of on-demand services, they allow docs to fully focus on their patients. Recurring practice revenue is key. All good things. Um, the key difference really is that, in that concierge practices continue to have a third-party payer element in, in many cases. And that, I think, is where we draw that definitional line and also usually a little higher price point. But again, this is at the primary care level for the most part. So if you were here for episode two, that was your takeaway. 
um, thriving in direct care. You know, I think we're going to hear some of this today uh, because direct care uh, in a specialty sense is, I'm sure uh, there are takeaways from this episode that we could import to today's discussion. But independent practice is once again rewarding and viable um, with this new, this new direct-to-consumer model. Recognize the difference between thriving and surviving. That's key. Uh, it's not hanging on by your fingernails. Uh, it's, it's actually thriving in this new model. And this, this allows you to do that if you do it right. Focus on the vital few, outsource the rest. That's a business takeaway. Any small business needs to be doing this today. To succeed today in, in today's competitive economy, everything flying at you at once, you got to focus on the vital few, outsource anything you can, get it off your plate. Time is money. Time lost is costlier than you think. Uh, so bear that in mind when you're launching a practice or trying to ramp up. And then uh, no practice or business is an island. You're never going to do this by yourself. You have to reach out. And, and that really is a nice segue to episode four. The last time we were together, we talked about building micro networks. So the optimal ecosystem for consumers is this notion of a micro network. I'm sure we'll hear about that today when it comes to specialty medicine, uh, how specialists, direct care specialists work with the primary care side. Uh, the other takeaway, localized in quotes, localized has taken on new meaning. So broaden your, your thinking around what localized means. It's not just uh, geography any longer. Uh, the key components, hear about this today, unfettered communication between professionals, clear handoffs and follow-ups, persistent patient advocacy at every turn and transparent pricing. So those were the takeaways from micro networks. Today, these were the takeaways that, that uh, really hit the nail on the head and then we'll get into our, our, our guest speakers today. Um, but just a, a big bold yes, yes. We had questions that came, you know, is this viable? Is it feasible today? Uh, for direct care specialists. Yes, independent direct specialty care is viable, it's profitable, and it's growing. So that's the good news. We're going to hear from, from two uh, physicians today who are, are, are in the thick of it, uh, representing each of those. To set themselves apart, any consumer business, which is what we're in, in medical care, must deliver clear value, attractive pricing, and superior customer service. Bingo, end of story. Uh, especially when you compare a model like this to the prevailing alternatives, right? That's how, that's how you win in consumer service businesses like this. Um, DSC pricing, direct specialty care pricing must reflect the patient encounter. We had some, some questions about that before the uh, webinar today. So we're going to talk about how to set pricing, how to adjust it so that it makes sense for consumers. A robust customer acquisition pipeline is critical. A lot of questions around this. How do you attract patients? How do you fill your schedule? We're going to hear uh, from a couple of doctors um, how they do it, how they um, you know, have refined that model. I will say there is no silver bullet for this. And this is a question we get quite often in these, this, this uh, webinar series. How do I fill my practice? How do I market my practice? Um, there is no, you're not going to get that from a webinar. I'm sorry. You're not going to get that from a checklist you download off the internet. Uh, and you're probably not going to get that from um, somebody who is not in this space, uh, whether it's a marketing firm or someone else that, that purports to be able to do this kind of thing. So just beware. Uh, there are many ways to build that customer acquisition pipeline. It's critical that you build it. I'm going to talk about some, some ways today to do that, but it's not, it's, there, there is no magic formula there. Independent practices have the innate advantage of running lean and mean, and we're going to hear uh, different strategies that you can keep operations very low cost, very efficient. Uh, that in turn will help uh, the economic viability and, and probably keep you sane as a, as a physician owner of your practice too. So I want to um, introduce today's featured speakers uh, and I will let each of them tell you more, but the, uh, there are some um, brief synopses uh, online. So first, uh, Dr. Grace Torres Hodges, welcome to the show today. And uh, if you would, please introduce yourself just briefly and then uh, we'll move on to the discussion. Hi everyone, I'm um, Grace Forrest Hodges. Everybody calls me Dr. Grace. Um, I have been a direct specialty care uh, physician for five years. My, my move to transition to this uh, was after 15 years of insurance-based practice. Um, there is, like Adam said, there is no silver bullet. You, you have to work if you want this to work. Um, but this is definitely, from a physician's perspective, um, a very viable model. Um, that returns happiness back to, to practicing medicine. And from a, a patient's perspective, 
um, one of the things that we learn is always to first do no harm. For me, um, doing direct care is first do no harm to my patients for sure, because I'm looking at them clinically and also financially, but also first do no harm to myself. Um, you, it's hard to, to continue in a third party world these days and um, to, to alleviate a lot of the stressors out there, this was a, a godsend. Wonderful. Thank you. Look forward to hearing more about your uh, symphonic career as well when we have more time someday. Dr. Granita, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And would you please uh, introduce yourself as I've, yeah, I've moved the slide along. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Adam, for the invitation. And um, I want to say that I'm very honored to be here with a pioneer of uh, the direct specialty care movement, Dr. Grace. Um, my name is Diana Garnita. I'm a rheumatologist, um, and I have started my um, my adventure in direct care about a year and a half ago uh, when um, I decided to start a telemedicine company with the purpose to broaden the access to rheumatology. And thinking about how I want to design my practice, I thought about what I need and what I like to do. So I enjoy spending time with patients. I enjoy educating patients, but I also um, enjoy quality time with my family. So trying to um, think about how to do those things, I discovered or I rediscovered the direct primary care model. And I tried without knowing that there are other specialists in the country, I tried to create a model for, for a specialist like me. Uh, rheumatology is a specialty where uh, you see patients chronically. Some of them, they do become your patients for life. However, um, there are few rheumatologists uh, in the country, and most of us, we are located on the East Coast or on the West Coast. And for majority of patients, it's a struggle to come to see us. And we also are considered to be a very expensive uh, specialty from the point of view of our labs, our imaging, our medication. So I'm here today to tell you that many of these prices can be um, made extremely affordable if you find the right um, connections and if you dig hard into the system. Wonderful. Well, welcome to you both. And, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Looking forward to jumping right in. And uh, we, we had a little chat before we went live today, just for the audience, uh, for your benefit. And we're going to run through a couple of the, the really commonly asked issues or com commonly, uh, I guess, the issues that arise quite a bit. Um, but I said, hey, you're the experts on this. If we want to deviate and, and go off script a bit, that's fine. But a couple of, uh, just to hit it head on, uh, because I think there's been a lot of fear in the, in the community. Is this even feasible? Right. And I know, again, you mentioned, Dr. Nina, even even the primary care side might have led the way a little in terms of just timing when that started, uh, you know, some of the pioneers of this movement 20 years ago now. But uh, absolutely, you know, still some confusion out there. Is it feasible? And I think the answer is a resounding yes from your own experiences. But I, I asked the question, too, how does this differ from primary care? And I thought it was instructive to, to kind of get into that. I had a couple of bullet points that, yeah, your encounters may be a bit more episodic. You're not going to maybe perhaps have that relationship that spans years and years and years and years in some cases. Uh, there also may be a higher price point and you may have a, a stronger or a more critical role for referrals in terms of feeding the practice. But, you know, could you weigh in on that uh, just in turn of, uh, you know, how this is different primary care and then also the challenges that are potentially unique to direct specialty care today? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and jump in on this one first and, and build off of what Diana was mentioning. Um, you know, with rheumatology, um, there are a lot of chronic um, conditions uh, with the patient base that you're dealing with. Um, I uh, specialize in podiatric medicine and surgery. Um, so there is a crossover with many of my rheumatology colleagues. Um, we are dealing with the same chronic autoimmune conditions, uh, um, a lot of deformities, a lot of the arthritis is associated with it. Um, but I also, as a surgeon, we have a lot of trauma-based and also um, urgent care type of situations that are not, um, uh, not chronic and, like you said, more episodic. Um, that's, that's one of the difficulties which 
um, direct specialty care has, because there are so many different specialists and models to offer care to patients that you can't have one specific one. Um, you know, I applaud those that can, can find their, their, their mix. From my perspective and from what I've learned in the last five years is that um, the type of practice that I wanna set up is actually more like, uh, as we mentioned earlier in the earlier webinars is direct consumer and it's the, the actual fee for service um, thing. So my prices, and my services are listed and um, you, you, you pick choose based on what is offered at the time. Um, but uh, I, I, that, that is one of the bigger things that makes the specialty medicine differ from primary care. Makes sense. How about Dr. Donita, any challenges that are unique you feel to this, this practice model? I believe we are trying to create here a model for a uh, specialist. And uh, as you very well said, uh, as very well said here, there is not um, a magic formula for specialties. There are specialties like cardiology, endocrinology um, that can provide chronic uh, management or rheumatology. Uh, but there are also other specialties like dermatology, for example, or an ENT physician that will not be able to see the patients unless they need to be seen. So you have to have the, the uh, mindset of being able to pivot things and offer the patients what they need. And I think um, the patients, they also have to understand that they are there not for primary care, they are there for a specialized service and yes, we do treat one disease that they have, but we treat it to the next level. So that value needs to be reflected in the price that they pay. Um, it takes a little bit of time to educate the patient to uh, make it understand why you have to charge them. And um, regarding referrals, um, when, when you think about um, how to build your practice, we know that specialists they rely on, on the referral systems from, um, from other physicians, other specialists, but also majority of the referrals, it comes from the primary care. And that's why I have started, um, when I started my practice, I have also started uh, my collaboration with the DPC community. So I offer them my help. I, um, you know, I offer them educational lectures to open a gate that was closed for many years. Unfortunately, in the last, you know, I would say five, 10 years, specialists stopped communicating with the primary care and the other way around because of lack of time, I believe. And because we were drawn in too much typing, coding, billing, all of that. Um, and that, you know, kind of creates, um, recreating that relationship, uh, it's going to be extremely important to, to feed your practice with patients from primary care. But don't forget that patients right now, they have all the tools that they need. They just go on Google and they find information about your practice and they find information about you. And as you said, those three things, the value that you offer, the price that you put, and also the customer service that you offer. Yes, we call our patient customers, but they, are, are, they, they have to be treated right. In this way, patients will, will recognize your value, your practice, and they will talk about you. So they will be the next level of your referrals. I'm gonna, if I can jump back back in and, and again, flow off of, um, of what uh, Diana mentioned. With referrals, what's interesting in the current system of third-party payers and insurance base, I'll use my own specialty as a, uh, an example. There is discrepancy already as it is from the patient's perspective. If a patient has an HMO, basically in order to come in and see a surgical specialist, they have to uh, go through their primary, primary care and get referred out. Um, ironically, in some of the other private PPO plans, it's not always the same. It depends upon the actual plan. And in, in podiatry for podiatric surgeons and podiatric medicine, the components of, uh, of both what we're dealing with is that um, some insurances 
you have to go through your, uh, your primary. Some insurances, you can go direct. So that's very confusing from a patient's perspective. I have a lot in, in, in the older years when I was still in insurance base. I'd have a lot of patients not come in and see me, not realizing that they don't have to come in through a, uh, a gatekeeper, so to speak. So again, as, as Diana said, we, we actually have, from the patient's perspective, all the tools to get a hold of us now and um, going direct, getting rid of that third party uh, bureaucracy in between, that's, that's key. Um, so it's, it's definitely doable. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're trying to find the way. It's happening. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's the, the consumerism within, um, within medical care today is, is reaching new heights. And I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize that sometimes that um, you, people, uh, yes, is the prevailing notion still to think as a consumer of purchasing healthcare through the insurance coverage that you have. Quite, yeah, I think that might be still the prevailing notion, but the consumerism aspect, people that realize, you know, I've got a sky high deductible insurance is going to be no help here. Or, you know, I love people that talk about, well, you need to go, go over here because that will help you hit your deductible and then insurance kicks in. Wait a minute, I'm going to go spend more money just to reach a level where somebody else then pays my bill. I mean, that's not like a carnival game. That's ridiculous, right? So the, the point is the consumerism is on the rise. I think also the one thing I wanted to relate is a, a story that I was told just briefly uh, by an orthopedic uh, surgeon who... Uh, when you talk about challenges faced by specialists today, and, and I do want to pay homage to the, the notion that specialty medicine is vast and broad. And so we, we're not trying to paint with too broad of a brush, but it does have, I think, quite a bit more variance than you might find in the primary care world. So it can be a lot of different things, right? So trying to channel all that through this notion of direct specialty care, we've got to keep it, keep the definition fairly broad. But this orthopedic surgeon was talking about the reason he left hospital-driven insurance-based medicine. And he talked about the pressure placed on him. And he, I will um, uh, uh, not reveal the name to protect the innocent. But you know, he talked about being you know, told that uh, every six patients that walk through that door, whether they're referred, whether they, whether they walk in on their own accord, you need to send four of the six to the operating table. I mean, that, that is, you talk about why, why are healthcare costs out of control? Exhibit A. Your Honor, I mean, there, you know, absolutely. That he said, look, that all six could possibly uh, may not need any sort of intervention to that degree. Maybe physical therapy helps. Maybe we can go a different direction. Maybe cooperating or coordinating more with the primary care doc, you can fix the issue. But I think specialists in the system still face those types of pressures because, let's face it, a lot of specialty medicine it is a higher price point, and that it, it's it's a revenue driver for the medical the the system today, if you will. But um, I think that that's amazing when you say that pressure is completely removed. Um, now we have absolutely 100% aligned incentives with our patients. Look what you can do. And so that, that's just a cautionary tale for those of us um, on, in the audience today who might not be clinicians who are looking at this as where does it fit in the, the notion of improving healthcare, lowering cost. We're going to talk about that later on, but that's, that's again, right there. It's in the thick of it. Go ahead, Dr. Grace, please. Well, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna throw in a story. Just happened just a few minutes ago. I I because I'm seeing patients this morning. Um, I had a patient that um, called us up and said that they had dropped something on their foot, um, and so you know, a fracture, possibly a fracture on on it. And you know, their choice. This is the patient's choice now. They had the choice to go over to urgent care or to the emergency room and get their foot checked. You know, think about what the cost of going time for the patient, going over, being assessed by the ER doctor or urgent care physician, getting an x-ray through their system, and then doing the treatment. You know, that time and also the efforts put out by and, and all the charges put out, um, that, that will rack up um, a bill for that patient. Patient called me up this morning, actually texted us this morning, said, hey, I dropped something on my foot, called my office, and I said, let's get them in. And so we got them in this morning. My price uh, for it is just one because it's the visit included, also the exam, the x-rays, and the treatment. Um, fortunately, it wasn't something that I have to bring to the operating room, but you know, time-wise, that took them 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. You know? Sure. 
um, compared. So a lot to be said about what you were saying using the other orthopedic example too. For those of you looking at this from a lean frontier standpoint and, and more efficiently engineering healthcare, this is a major cost driver and this is how it gets better. This is it. This is the solution. The next, the next slide I have, and then we'll get into some FAQs. I think it really goes to the heart of how, how can specialists be successful in direct care. And um, we've talked about these three points already today, but love to hear you expound on the notion of, of you know, setting attractive pricing and how that really must reflect, as you just started to allude to, Dr. Grace, you know, the, the experience that the consumer or the customer, the patient is really going to, to walk away with. And then even something Dr. Grenada said, you know, really elevating that, that level of service to something beyond, you know, I, I love the phrase, you know, exceed customers' imaginations, right? So you're not, and, and it's not hard given how terrible the system, the healthcare system is today, right? Uh, but how you provide a higher level of service and, and and even that that clear, you know, cooperation handoff, the you know, kind of that team approach that you can you can engage in with a primary care doc, and then also we can talk about robust customer acquisition pipeline. But I don't want to do too much to talk. I'll turn it over to the experts to to weigh in on these three points and and anything else you think is critical to being successful in direct specialty care. I'll start with um, with the first question that you have: how to set an attractive price. I don't think that there is a formula uh, for setting up your price. I hear all kind of uh, solutions for uh, coming up with an attractive price. Um, and also I, what I realized is that as a specialist, if your price is too low, patients think that you don't offer value. So, but if your price is too high, they think they cannot afford it. So. As, as I said, there is not um, a formula. It's based on what you want to create for, uh, for your practice and for your revenue. And um, um, you, know, you can take the CMS price as a reference and you can add to that, or uh, you can uh, actually calculate you know, your overhead for the whole year. And again, this is not invented by me. This is something that I heard others. This is uh, some sort of a math. So you take the overhead for the whole year and then uh, you divide it by the amount of time that you wanna spend with the patients. And in this way, you will know how much you spend for your practice to, to see a patient. And then think about how much you wanna make in a year and then divide that again over the time that you want to spend with patients. And you can add those two numbers and you can come up with a price. Um, but there are also other formulas and your price will not be set up in stone. So uh, be ready to adjust it, be ready to pivot, be ready to offer different uh, levels of service too, um, and adjust it to the patient needs because some patients might need to see you once or twice or uh, just a few times, but some patients will remain you know, practice chronically. And you should concentrate on those because they need your help and they will be the ones that will value your practice the most. Now, um, it's also very important to um, create that customer experience because as I said, they will be the ones that will talk about you. You know, that, that, that's the way that it's gonna be done in the future. Mm -hmm. And with the resources that they have, and all these websites that they post reviews about you, people will hear about you. So it's it's very important how you deliver care. And I, and I think uh, that's 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 also key to remind from a physician's perspective. You know, you're not going to change the way you practice medicine. We went into medicine to treat patients, the whole patient and have time to talk to them and have time to understand what's going on so that we can help them um, live better lives and, um, and help cure and, and treat their, their illnesses. Um, and that is that value. It, we are not competing on price. And that, that sometimes, you know, one of the things is that in our current healthcare arena, everybody thinks that everything should just be covered. Um, you know, co-pays, and, and the, the copay was probably the worst thing in the world that happened because it ended up making it almost seem like a debit or prepaid card. That's not how the world works. And as, as Dr. Diana had mentioned, you know, we're, we're small businesses. Private practices understand that we are small businesses and you treat it like any other consumer small business, um, looking at your uh, 
P&Ls, look at your cash flow, setting up budgets um, and everything like that. Uh, one of the, the things is that we're competing on value, not on price. But one of the biggest questions that a lot of patients, excuse me, a lot of doctors actually ask and say, how do you figure out your prices? Um, it used to be a little bit difficult because the contracting with reimbursements from insurance was is still and still all hidden. Um, but now we have so many online services that have costs uh, out there that you can do comparisons, you can do market research. Um, this is not something that you'll do by yourself. You do have to find people who've done this. There are people who've done this beforehand. And I, mm -hmm. one of the big ones for me, from a, from a surgical perspective, I looked out to the surgery center of Oklahoma. Um, they have it all mapped out there already. And it, it's explained to them. Um, you look at your local um, area to figure out um, what, what the, the fair market price would be. I talked to my patients. I bottom line talked to my patients. I said, you know, if you are living in a metropolitan uh, big time city, your price schedules and your prices for everything, it doesn't matter about healthcare, but even just for food and other things, it's going to be a lot more expensive than what it would be um, in, in more rural communities. So um, looking for pricing, again, no silver bullet to figure out specifically what it is. You, you work and look at your market you look at the market that you're dealing with, which includes your consumer, in this case, our patients. Makes total sense. Appreciate you both saying that. And, that, and that's something we do at, at Freedom Health Works. First step, right? It, 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 we like to, any doc we work with, any practice we work with, primary care, specialty, you name it, you, you map it out ahead of time. And that's that's good practice for any any business before you launch, right? Make sure this is viable. Make sure that the market will support it. Make sure that you're happy with the numbers you see and you're going to wind up in a place that you have targeted in terms of both um, your your workload and your um, your income from that practice, but absolutely, I, I want to say I just I feel and this is observational only, but I feel a lot of times uh, doctors will discount the premium that consumers are willing to pay for elevated service and convenience and certainty of price, and and by that I, you know. Sometimes, yeah, I'm sure you'll have consumers come in and they'll want to price check you versus brand X versus the, inter, you know, the, the insurance company. But again, people are busy today and people recognize that good service and professionals such as yourselves, that these don't come for free. And, and, and they're willing to pay for those aspects of the elevated service. And, and again, just knowing, hey, my bill will be X. And knowing that before I go in, um, don't discount that. That is absolutely valuable. And, and don't undersell, don't underprice your offerings. So that's a huge mindset change for doctors. Absolutely. We are naturally altruistic. We want to help. Um, you know, we, we volunteer our services and you, you give yourself to things. Um, one of the things that you, you realize is that, um, and that's where almost there's a moral injury in the way that reimbursement occurs because you're not being paid for what you're actually giving out. Um, there, someone else is dictating your worth, and um, the skill set, the knowledge, that's worth something. And um, it, 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 it's still every day you have to kind of uh, remind yourself that that's that's the case. And I'm not trying to to put put us um, above anyone, but when we're used efficiently and we're actually getting reimbursed at the right levels for our specialty care. Your efficient time in the office and spent there, you actually have time to help others, and then give that service free. Sure. Um, you know that's that's one of those things. I have time now because I'm not having to meet X amount of patients to make the ends meet at the end of the day because I'm getting 100% instead of only 50% on the dollar, um, and I can go out and volunteer, and you can discount, and you can and, and make payment plans, um, you know, all, all those things. So, awesome here stuff. I, go ahead. Yes, here I have to agree because you have the liberty to choose what you want to do and how you want to price yourself. And uh, you also have the time to volunteer, as Grace said. Um, I'm teaching to one of the universities. I'm continuing to teach rheumatology. I wouldn't be able to do that if I would be in a traditional practice. 
And in addition to that, I think that this mindset that we have as physician not to value ourselves, not to value our profession, it has to change. Um, we are very respectful towards all the professions and I teach my kids to respect everyone because everyone has a role. Um, and we never, never comment when we call a lawyer and we, you know, they ask a payment and, uh, or the customers never comment on that. Or when you kind of call the plumber to come to fix your sink, or when you call uh, your accountant to do your taxes. So you know that you have to pay that value. But when it comes to physicians, patients and customers or have to understand we have to be paid too and we are not paid by their insurance we are paid by them you know if if they make the payment that conception that misconception that they pay the insurance is not helping us so uh, many times i have these discussions with my patients that insurance um, or healthcare insurance does not mean coverage and does not mean that everything is paid and does not mean that you have access. That's, that's valuable for them. Access and the time with them is extremely valuable. Once they understand that with their own insurance, they don't have access, they change their mind. They understand our value. And I think not- I would suggest many times just to jump in though, and I, I, I didn't, I would bet that the pricing that consumers will experience in your practices or in many like yours in direct specialty care, you mentioned uh, Dr. Smith's uh, Surgery Center of Oklahoma, in the end, those are far below what they're going to pay even with insurance in terms of out-of-pocket and total cost in the system. So I just want to bring that up that you know this is, this is direct-to-consumer. It's a better quality deliverable. And in many cases, if not all cases, it actually is less expensive in the long run. Exactly. And you know, there's also personal responsibility there's something to be said about when, just like when you were little and your parents were trying to teach you the value of, of, of money um, and putting value on, on things, when it was your turn to spend what grandma and grandpa gave you money-wise from Christmas to buy your own toy, that toy was so special to you. But what's, what's really cool about what I've seen, at least a trend, and I really have, I should do maybe a, a research on it a little bit more, but my patients are healthier. Um, you know, there are, we, we have very, very sick patients because we deal with a lot of diabetics, we deal with a lot of, a lot of terminal in- illnesses and everything like that. But when patients take control of their own health care, as far as who they're receiving their services, and they understand the value of that, they pay attention to themselves. If it's being done for you, because you don't know what the prices are when insurance, and you just pay your copay, um, you you just assume that someone's there to take care of it. But this actually puts a little bit also of onus on the patient again. Um, and we have healthier healthier groups. We can do more to be preventative rather than being, it's like being proactive instead of being reactive. Sure. No, I love it. I, and we'll move on. I, I, I appreciate everybody hanging out there. We're going to go a little bit long, but I just had this discussion this weekend with a, a friend of mine and, and he was uh, weighing the options in front of him for a specialty care visit. And he was saying, but again, I can stay in network and, you know, they're, are they a network? Are they not? And I go, do you know what that means? That, that's like walking into to, to Starbucks and you say, well, what's the price of a cup of coffee? Well, I don't know, but my network's already renegotiated that or pre-negotiated that. Well, does that give you any comfort? Well, yeah, because they've negotiated a price. Well, what if the price for a cup of coffee is $57 and, oh, they're going to get you half off. Lucky you, Right. I mean, I was like, that's I, I, ludicrous. He's like, yeah, that's right. I'm going to go to someone like yourself that actually tells me the price up front. Anyways, I, I just thought I love that, that. Was intriguing. I yeah. love that. Um, well, actually, actually, a friend of mine mentioned something to me. If you go to a restaurant um, and, you know, you don't know the price is there, are you going to order the best steak and the best bottle of wine? probably going to wait to see how much it's going to cost so it's the same with uh usage of usage of services in in uh in medicine you have to be aware about how much it's going to cost and you have to be aware if it's needed or not so that's the beauty that i have in my practice that i can customize the, the care based on the patient needs i don't throw ten thousand labs there just because i can I will select those that he needs or she needs 
and I will customize the care to their needs. Fantastic. I, 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 I would love to have this conversation for the next hour. We, we probably should move on. I know we're going to go a little bit long. I hope you can hang out for a little bit longer today, uh, everybody listening. But one thing, and, and this last piece, uh, the last point on here, I know we had a lot of, a lot of curiosity from um, the doctors that are tuning in today, you know, how you go about building that, that robust customer acquisition pipeline. You've mentioned it. It's somewhat of an all of the above approach. I know from our standpoint, you know, I call it the special sauce, kind of the alchemy of, of how you uh, market to consumers today. And, and you pick these best practices and you blend social with digital, with, you know, a lot of different things. I, it's beyond my expertise. And I know uh, Chris actually mentioned to me, you know, very few people on this planet can be fantastic doctors like yourselves and master the art of consumer marketing today. It's a really tough, you know, ask. So could you weigh in though on how you've seen uh, some success in your practice in, in, in filling the schedule? Yeah. Um, one of the things is that you're going to still use your old referral bases, um, which primarily is from primary care physicians. Um, but the, the, the most, um, valued one is always going to be um, patient referrals. Um, let your work show for itself. All of these insurance-based metrics for quality, the most important quality is whether or not a patient will return to you and, um, and they're satisfied and will refer someone else. Um, as, you know, as far as um, more, more doctors are actually doing this than they realize. I tell my patients all the time, ask wherever you go, whether it's a physician, a facility, uh, a lab, or a hospital, ask, what's the cash price? If they're able to give you a cash price, they have the option to go direct care. Um, and that's, that's out there. You just, a lot of people don't realize it. My husband and I, the other day, were just realizing in the midst of all of uh, these discussions that, we got, we got swayed by that when our, um, our children's um, deliveries were not covered by our insurance and we paid the insurance rate. Um, little did we know back then, we didn't know how to ask for the cash price. And so I tell my patients now, ask for the cash price. Um, but um, it, it, it is, you'll still use all your regular marketing. You don't, you don't sit on your laurels. Um, you always make sure that you're out there and showing people what you do and, and let your work speak for itself. I have to agree. Um, I think uh, you have to build your own referral system from primary care physicians to other specialists. Pick up the phone and call them and talk to them about their patients. They will really appreciate that. And answer quick questions. Uh, when a primary care physician calls me to ask a few questions uh, for a patient, if it needs to be referred or not, I'm very happy to, to give that answer. Um, and then uh, I think that the regular marketing channels are still there, still um, valuable. Uh, Google My Business is something that every independent physician should have. And also encourage your patients to write reviews about, uh, about you. I was extremely shy in the beginning, um, but I think that, you know, usually, usually patients that are very happy, they don't think about writing a review about you. Um, so encourage them to write about you because this is important for people to realize if they were happy or not. And um, then, you know, I'm not a master in social media, but I think social media does, um, does at least it, it will create a presence for you and people will have you in the back of their mind. Even if they don't meet you, maybe they will say, oh, I heard about that doctor that is doing this. So you could try it. Um, but you have to combine those things mm -hmm. to Agreed. be successful. Agreed. And that that's... Um... Appreciate you saying that. I, I had a couple of bullet points. You mentioned these plug into these emerging direct care communities. I know, you know, that's what we try to do at Freedom HealthWorks is, you know, hey, put put the notion up there, put a map up there, show, and there's there's others like this too, right? But you mentioned there are more doctors than you think that are doing this. And, and so put your hand up, you know, join something like this, at least make your presence known and you'll be You'll be surprised, I think, how many other doctors on the primary care side and the specialty side 
you know, you start to build that micro network and suddenly the patient flow really amplifies, right? Because there are a tremendous number of patients and consumers looking for this today too. We keep saying that. Don't think that they're not. They're out there. They're looking for it. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, how do you how do you weave that, um, you know, direct to consumer marketing? Again, it's beyond my understanding. It's it's what we have folks on staff that do that and, and figure that out. And so, but you want to make sure you're deploying your dollars intelligently. And we've seen some horror stories too, where practices get somebody who says, oh, I can market for you. They don't know the first thing about the direct care world and they waste a lot of money chasing nothing. So make sure you're working with somebody who knows what they're doing and can weave those pieces together. And then you're prepared um, you know, to receive, that's just, this is more business than, than clinical, but prepared to receive those leads and, and convert them. I, I, I want to move on here. I, I, you know, we might've, we've talked about some of the success stories. Um, you obviously both have, have uh, you factor into this surgery centers. I, I had up here because that's maybe the best known example. You mentioned Dr. Keith Smith's um, operation and, and I love to tell that story, but um, you know, would is there any any other pointers you would add in terms of critical to your success? And I know we're running a bit long here, so we may not get to the FAQs today, but um, perhaps we can answer those offline or something. Yeah, I the example that I gave earlier, the urgent care type uh, situation. You know that that's that's a big thing. Um, convenience factors. You know you're available for your patients. I will tell you, COVID probably was one of the big things that um, that actually helped us. I, I hate to say it that way. If there's any blessing from COVID um, is that, you know, when everything shut down in March and April, um, the hospitals were, were getting rid of elective procedures and everything like that. My office-based surgeries were still able to go on. I could still do wound debridements. I could still do biopsies, you know, biopsies that were some that actually ended up being melanomas. So getting that early treatment, that was key. Um, you know, I was still able to see patients without exposing them to um, a hospital hospital setting. Um, you know, t telemedicine with, with what Dr. Diana does, um, you know, that's, that's not new to DPC and DSC type of practices. We were, were already doing that. Um, I did that a lot with my, my wound care patients so that they don't have to travel. Um, and there's that continuity of care, which is what we're trying to do with our, with our patients. Um, and then you have to think out of the box a lot of the times. When my patients couldn't come to me, no one's telling me that I can't go to them. So I did, I've returned, I've been doing house calls. Um, so, you know, that's, that's available um, for them, you know. And so uh, there, there are a lot of ways you have to just really think out of the box in order to find your successes with this. I think behind any success story, it's a lot of work. Um, and uh, I will start there. Be prepared to work hard in the beginning and be prepared to learn things that you never thought you're going to learn. Um, myself, I learned about marketing, about uh, how to plan a business, how to look at numbers and um, what to do to make it work. And I will tell you also a story because I know people love stories. I had um, a phone call one day from a primary care physician for a patient that after um, a vaccine, she developed a very uh, severe um, inflammatory arthritis. So this patient lives in a very big city in California with five medical centers, big names are, you know, across the street, and she could not get an appointment with a rheumatologist. I've seen her the next day. And because she had a very high deductible, she was very cautious about the cost. So I offer her the cost of everything, the treatments, um, the laboratory workup, the imaging workup, and uh, my consultation. And she was astonished because, um, you know, she made her own research and she come up with thousands of dollars to pay. And when I talked to her, I was able to discount it to hundreds of dollars. So that patient went to, an art, to, a, to a local newspaper and she published the story. And many patients after that came to see me. So it's the power of your work that will drive your success. I love that. I, I, and this, this entire, again, webinar series is built on this notion that, you know, consumers ultimately demand the best. They demand better value, better quality, and they drive the best pricing possible. And what you're saying, both of you, is that this is becoming a reality. It is a reality today in the specialty medical world, 
which is hugely heartening because again, if there's any policymaker listening today on the on the on the uh, the webinar, yeah. this is a major cost driver in healthcare today, and and seeing this kind of innovation absolutely remedy that high cost and produce a better outcome and produce happier consumers is, is wonderful. And, and again, I think that this is the better solution more often than not wins in the end. And this is the better solution. So I thank you both for joining me today. I know we ran over a bit. I thank you for hanging out. Those of you in the audience who uh, have, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, we'll get to FAQs perhaps offline, but some of these we answered today. How does this ecosystem uh, solve for the high cost of healthcare? What challenges do you face? I apologize. We, the discussion was great. I think we did tackle a lot of these just in the course of the discussion. But I um, I wanted to jump ahead. I know I'm flipping through some slides here. This is going to be the next episode of this webinar that we that we join. And today you see direct care specialists were highlighted in yellow. More on this later. It's a sneak peek how this all fits together, because everything we've talked about in this with this webinar series is leading up to this. Right? Is there the emergence of an alternative system? that we can now point to. And this is one of the final pieces to that puzzle. So the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, this is really exciting. So tune in next time, next month, and we really get into that. Um, this is again, a map of, of look at this becoming a reality. And these are the, these are the practices that we work with, uh, the freedom docs around the country, but look at the, the, the diversity of specialty there starting to pop up. This is really exciting. Uh, today's takeaways, we'll hit it again real quick. Yes. It's viable, it's profitable, and it's growing. If you're a specialist out there looking to do this, you're fed up, don't want to take it anymore, great. Great doctors like this are, are here uh, to show you the way. Uh, but you've got to deliver those core values, right? Attractive pricing, clear value, customer service that exceeds expectations. The pricing is um, something that, that you'll have to nail. Um, and and the, the customer acquisition pipeline is critical. But as we've heard today, very doable. And, and again, this is, uh, again, uh, companies like ours at Freedom Health Works, you know, are, are here to help you do that as well. Um, but always think about running a lean and mean practice as well, because that is critical for any small business, let alone uh, a practice starting up. Uh, come back on this 23rd of, of, of September, excuse me, 23rd of September for putting it all together, uh, all leading up to our first freedom.conference in October. So, uh, We'll see you next time. Uh, doctors, thanks again for joining. Sorry for the kind of rushed wrap up here, but I really appreciate you coming today and I hope that uh, you enjoyed uh, your time with us. Adam, thank you so much. Thank you. Skylar, back to you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for attending today. And just a reminder, you will get a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. Thank you to our presenters for providing everything, all that wonderful content for us today. Have a great rest of your week and we will see you later.